So um, at the risk of just before we bring Jill in to speak more about the, the report and the, the findings, at the risk of um, pushing too hard on the technology, we've got a lot of people here watching um, and obviously we're mainly going to hear from the panellists, um, but, but you can submit your questions um, through the Q&A feed and we'll use some of those later. We're just going to try and just get a snapshot of the room um, first now by just giving you all a, a question to answer um, on your screens quickly about, about what we feel about the social connection. So if you just want to choose, um, have we become more connected nationally during this crisis or less connected? Um, and has your local community become more connected or less connected? If you just give us your answers to those and submit them, we'll just be able to show everybody a feeling for the sort of 150 of you that are here and what, what, is, the, what is the overall feel. And um, deliberate on that and we'll, um, we'll close it down quite quickly so we can show you the, um, show you the results and then hear um, from Jill Wachter about this, the, the opportunities of this moment um, as well as the challenges um, as the APPG report has, has, has looked at them. So let's close that poll now and see what, uh, see, 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 see what, see what happened from people who submitted it. And the answers are slightly more connected, a bit of optimism at the national level, a bit of a lot of optimism at the local level. And I wonder, um, Jill, if you want to take us through the uh, the report, is is um, is that is is that what, what what's reflected in what we've heard from people who submitted this inquiry? Thanks, Jill. So, our uh, yes. Uh, what we found is reflected in the voting, uh, but our public opinion, the situation that we're working in is quite, uh, quite fluid at the moment. Uh, things are changing rapidly. Uh, I don't think I need to kind of stress the context that uh, we're working in, uh, but uh, these issues really came up uh, a lot. And because uh, of the volatility of the situation, uh, we decided to hold a two-part inquiry and we're reporting on part one. Uh, part one is about understanding the situation and sharing good practice. Later on in the year, uh, the APPG will come back to part two, which will look at uh, the long-term impacts of the crisis on social connection, social integration, and the lessons that we can learn from what has taken what, what's taken place. Our next slide. Uh, sorry, my slide seemed to have. Oh, okay. uh, so uh, the remit of the inquiry. This is in uh, the report. Those are the questions uh, which we which we uh, looked at. Uh, and uh, I now want to go very quickly through the findings. We looked at who was most at risk of social uh, isolation. And rather than lump people into, uh, into boxes, uh, we felt it was important to look at kind of risk factors which made people vulnerable to social isolation, but also are uh, protective uh, factors too. Uh, older people who may be at risk of social, social isolation because they live by themselves, they're not working, they're more likely to be digitally excluded, have much higher trust in their neighbours uh, to help. And trust in your neighbours, living in a high trust neighbourhood, is quite uh, a significant uh, protective factor. Finding two digital exclusion, uh, that's quite a major theme of the report. Obviously, in the uh, situation, we're using our, our digital to connect with friends and family for social reasons, to shop, but also to access information and uh, services. And digital exclusion is quite a major cause of 
social isolation. It also affects people uh, in different uh, ways uh, and differently. Asylum seekers who often have very good digital skills because they're connecting with uh, needing to connect with friends and family abroad uh, may not have uh, the uh, hardware or the Wi-Fi to connect. Whereas other groups of people uh, may not have the skills, uh, but access to the hardware is less of a problem. But overall in the UK, there are probably just over 5 million internet uh, non-users. And quite a big difference in patterns of internet non-use across the regions and uh, nations of the UK. One of the very strong uh, recommendations of the report is in the long term for our well-being, for our future prosperity. We've really got to have a big push on digital exclusion. Volunteering, another key theme. Our formal and informal volunteering are really important aspects of our social infrastructure. Although policy has tended to focus more on formal volunteering, where we give our time to formally constitutional, uh, constituted organisations, as opposed to the informal volunteering of helping out our friends uh, and neighbours. Our polling suggests that both informal and formal volunteering have increased significantly in uh, the crisis. 6% of people already helping out with a charity are uh, in uh, March uh, uh, 2020. And three quarters of a million people are signing up uh, to help uh, the NHS. We've also had uh, the emergence of a new type of volunteering, which I'll say a little bit more in a moment, and that is kind of mutual aid. Uh, nearly 3,000 uh, mutual aid groups, a type of volunteering which kind of spans informal and in uh, formal volunteering. However, our volunteering uh, isn't evenly represented uh, across the UK and some groups of people are less likely to volunteer now and previously. And basically, if you're younger, if you lived in a more deprived area, you are less likely to volunteer. And I've got quite a striking graph from uh, the most recent taking part survey of the government, which shows volunteering levels uh, across our the indices of multiple deprivation. So in the 10% most deprived areas, uh, only one in five people give their time, gave their time as a volunteer at least once uh, every, uh, in the last 12 months. And that's uh, uh, more than two in five in uh, the uh, most prosperous areas. So our uh, Volunteering are uh, increased, but it does seem to be tailing off now. Uh, and that's reflected in polling. And we make quite a, a number of recommendations on volunteering. It is a very important uh, driver of integration. And it's really important that this goodwill is harnessed now and turned into a legacy and we need a civil society infrastructure to support our volunteers and after this crisis is over uh, I think we need to push on our volunteering drives among those groups and areas where you've got less uh, volunteering. So I want to say a little bit about a new type of volunteering which we've called mutual aid, where groups of people come together to support each other, as well as reaching out to organisations and vulnerable members of, uh, uh, of uh, their local communities.
and we mapped uh, the mutual aid groups that had registered uh, with their local authorities or on the COVID mutual aid website. Nearly 3,000 uh, by the end uh, of April. And although that's a snapshot, uh, I think it's quite interesting because we identified uh, 25 areas which had much level, much lower level of this self-help. And these were often areas where uh, you had much higher population uh, churn, you had economic or ethnic divides and lower levels of civic participation, volunteering, voting, uh, so uh, a weaker social infrastructure. And I think Will will say more about the importance of building social infrastructure in a moment. So how groups will emerge, uh, I think is quite interesting and it's something that we will come back to later. A mixed picture in terms of community relations. We've had the unifying effects of the crisis and the overwhelming perception that most people are pulling together, that we've become closer. But we've also uh, had reports of hate crime targeted at people of Southeast Asian origin. That's reflected in police statistics and other community tensions associated with perceptions that some people aren't observing social distancing. Uh, the far right uh, extremist groups have been uh, active, uh, other extremist groups have been active in trying to exploit the crisis to advance uh, their agenda. Uh, so that is something to be cautious about. And this situation of lockdown is a kind of petri dish for conspiracy theories. Are uh, 5G associated with the virus? Social, social isolation makes much, much more likely that these conspiracy uh, theories uh, will take hold. Basically, because uh, your friends in the pub aren't kind of disabusing you of these theories. So this is something that uh, needs our uh, needs are uh, watching vigilance over and we make some recommendations on that it's essential that social media companies take down our uh, very factually and damaging our uh, conspiracy theories uh, and lastly we make a set of findings on local responses to the crisis coordination a major theme of the evidence and local authorities councils are, are doing well at our coordinating practical support at the local level but it is a challenging uh, issue and we also felt that there were some missed opportunities to address social isolation are uh, using the food deliveries to make contact with people more, having a conversation with people when you actually drop the food. So quickly and to finish, we make our 10 recommendations. Some short term recommendations now are embedding uh, a consideration of social connection into the government's overall response and the work of local resilience forums. Uh, as well as the day-to-day -day activities of uh, food banks uh, and other initiatives uh, targeting isolated people. Ha the council should have a cabinet lead whose remit covers social isolation and volunteering in this crisis. That we should share good practice a group of civil society organisations have come together uh, as the Connection Coalition. Uh, it's got a website, it's uh, run seminars, and it is a forum for sharing good practice. So use that structure to share what works. 
we very much liked our the digital champion schemes where by volunteers are supporting those who lack digital skills and confidence to go online and we felt that this could be extended now and in the future and perhaps using some of those who've offered their time as nhs volunteers with libraries closed groups like the homeless are don't have access to wi-fi so making sure that people have access to wi-fi are starting planning now to harness uh, the volunteering uh, legacy and for social media companies as i've said it's really important that they remove our uh, content but also report on what is coming up and we make some longer term recommendations as well uh, a commitment to reduce digital exclusion we think the integrated communities action plan and the plans of the uh, integration action areas need to be revised now in light of the crisis it would also be helpful i think if we had a minister uh, with responsibility for our uh, integration uh, in england we had a minister uh, for faith and communities whose remit uh, covered integration until February, but he wasn't replaced in the reshuffle. So uh, revising policy, ministerial lead uh, in all parts of the UK are uh, in the light of the crisis. And after the crisis, to push forward to increase levels of uh, volunteering. So that's a very brief snapshot of uh, the report, which is online, uh, which is uh, much more comprehensive, and uh, it's part one of an inquiry. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much, Jill. So those slides can be available as well online and on the Twitter feed or by email if people if people want them, um, as well as uh, summarising the report. We've had a, an overview there of the evidence we've received in uh, in phase one. That this has been about the initial experiences, the initial innovation that groups have um, uh, come up with, the, the challenges either in the short term or in the longer term that people that people perceive um, to open this out um, i'd like to bring in will tanner to um to talk to us about you know jill has described a mixed picture there uh, will of, of opportunities and challenges you've been working uh, specifically in several different um, local areas it'd be good to get your sense of what people have learned so far and what challenges that raises now for this next phase thank you sunder and thank you very much for asking me to join you uh, today and for all of the work that you're doing on this issue. Um, uh, so as you say, we've, uh, through our work, um, uh, looked at how the crisis is playing out in a number of different communities, as well as doing national level polling. So what I'd like to do is just set out some reflections on that from that work and um, perhaps point to some areas where I think, uh, in line with your recommendations, I would, I would add um, ministers and uh, others within within kind of policy networks should be should be thinking. Um, so the first the first reflection from our work, um, which was done in uh, Barking and Dagenham, Glasgow and uh, Grimsby, um, uh, through a series of interviews with with local authority leaders, charity leaders, and community groups. Um, uh, the first reflection I have is that. Uh, the, in the initial stages of this crisis, it was very clear that there was a kind of wellspring of activity. There was a huge amount of, uh, of, of kind of civic mindedness um, on, on behalf of or, or kind of through uh, kind of everyone in society. It was not something that was differentiated by demography or by ethnicity. Um, and it was something that felt to be relatively universal. In our polling, we found that people were actually more concerned about the fortunes, both in terms of health and financial impact of the virus of their, of their local community than they were about their own physical and mental health, or indeed 
the welfare of uh, their neighbours or indeed their own family. Um, so there, there was a kind of uh, a kind of view that the that community mattered, um, and that did materialise in terms of action. We saw it with the NHS volunteer scheme, but I think we've seen it at a much more granular level um, in communities around the country. So in some respects, I think the initial stages of this crisis highlighted the importance of social capital and what, what we call the kind of broader social fabric, the kind of the networks and institutions which underpin uh, place, um, uh, they underpin people's local um, sense of identity and belonging, uh, and they also to, to some degree under, underpin people's ability to respond um, comprehensively to the risks of the virus, whether that's in terms of social isolation, in terms of um, uh, kind of access to, to kind of medical or food supplies, or indeed access to other services. Um, however, uh, what we saw in our in our research was that there was some variation between different areas. Um, so it's clear that from our polling work that areas that have existing high levels of social capital where people trust their neighbours more in, kind of instinctively, um, they were more willing to do more for their local community. So, so there was a kind of positive relationship between existing social capital and uh, the kind of community response to the virus. Now, clearly, if you play that out over a number of weeks and months, there's a risk that actually the areas that do best over the next over, over this period are the ones that were already doing quite well and the ones that do worse um, uh, are potentially the ones that already uh, were, had a kind of more a kind of weaker or, or fraying social capital so you you kind of risk exacerbating existing inequalities um, in terms of social capital. I think the other thing that I would reflect on is that um, where we've seen successful responses it's often been bottom up rather than top down so in uh, in Glasgow um, and in Grimsby in particular, uh, we saw local organisations, um, uh, often kind of charity groups or community groups, um, some of which was entirely kind of new and self-generated, coming together to provide really effective responses to vulnerability in their communities. Um, uh, in Barking and Dagenham, we, we saw that the same thing, albeit organised by the local authority, which has acted very effectively as a kind of umbrella organisation for civic society to respond to the crisis. Um, where problems emerged, it was often in top-down responses. So we heard some problems with the, uh, the delivery of food parcels through the, the government's uh, shielded scheme and the, kind of, uh, the, the local resilience forum's work. Um, and that was largely a problem of coordination and, uh, and information flows. Uh, we've obviously in the last week or so seen some problems emerging around the NHS Volunteers app and uh, some people logging off the app or, turn, or deleting the app in, in frustration that, that the amount of demand is not there for their, for their kind of goodwill. Um, and so it seems, for, certainly from our research, that the bottom-up responses are more effective ways of responding to the crisis and that government might think about how to augment and uh, support local community uh, responses. Um, and then finally, I would just, I mean, we've, we've set out a number of recommendations, um, but a lot of them come down to a single point, which is that lots of community groups and charities seem to be experiencing what we call a kind of paradox of virtue effect at the moment, in the sense that uh, they are experiencing a massive crunch in their finances and their human resource just at the moment where their demand is exploding. Um, and that is likely to get much, much worse as we emerge from lockdown um, because lots of the problems that are currently being held within people's homes are going to spill out of, uh, into, into society and into communities. And lots of the charities which have been kind of running on empty, uh, kind of consuming their own fumes for the last few weeks, uh, are po possibly going to be at a point where they're most fatigued uh, when that demand starts exploding. Um, so we think that there is a real case for government to find ways to support those groups and those, those community organisations. Um, and actually, um, we, we, we've argued for what we call a social stimulus on, on the similar level to the public health and economic uh, initiatives the government has, has put out that might include um, financing supports, not necessarily entirely funded by the taxpayer. We, we call upon endowments and, uh, and corporates to also contribute to that, encouraged by government. Uh, we think there's some regulatory things government can do to, 
uh, to um, make it easier for, for charitable organizations to respond to that demand, including flexibility around furlough and allowing furloughed staff to volunteer back at the charities in which they're employed. Um, and, um, and we also call for uh, a nationwide mental health um, uh, program specifically to deal with the extremely high levels of anxiety and, and depression that are seeping into the statistics from the ONS um, and that is something in particular that we're very worried about where we think there is a case for rolling out especially uh, digital or community-based support to large numbers of people at scale very quickly in order to head off something that could have a really material impact down the line. Um, so those are just some initial reflections but I'm happy to come back on anything else. Thanks very much, um, Will. And there's some real challenges to pick up there, I think, in what you say about the value of the bottom-up um, approach, because we've got, we've got a sort of paradoxical challenge here. There's a surge of demand when we want to make sure we don't waste it. Um, and then the bottom-up demand is not necessarily distributed to where the need is, and yet, and yet that is where the knowledge is. So some real challenges, I think, for government, but all of the other actors, as well as to what to do with that, with that Opportunity. It's a great moment to bring um, Joe in as well. Um, just as we're reflecting on this uh, sphere of the challenge, obviously people getting on with things um, and innovating at pace. Um, to the extent we've got some breathing space to re re reflect on this stage, what are your reflections, Joe, on, on what, what people have learned about the opportunities and challenges that will be relevant to this next phase? Well, I just wanted to um, offer some reflections on the report and um, thank you for um, inviting me to comment. And, you know, I think the report's fantastic, really interesting findings, some really great examples of good practice. And I think you should be congratulated on responding so swiftly and positively in terms of the research that you've done. Um, I think some real things that struck me were particularly the thing around digital exclusion and how crucial that's become. Um, and that the number of people that have been affected is not necessarily distributed evenly. Um, and I was struck last night, last week in a, a conversation with Bradford about um, uh, that they were saying that as much as 30% of their communities don't have access to getting online. And then if they can get online, often two or three people within the same household are trying to use the same device. You know, if you're homeschooling and um, you've got children of different ages, then that makes very that makes things very difficult in terms of keeping your children engaged with school. So I suspect that digital exclusion occurs in specific pockets and in different communities. And I think it would be really good to know a bit more about that as we go forward and to understand that better, because I think it's going to be so vital as we emerge from this um, crisis. Um, I think the other thing that you point out in, in the report, which I think is of real value, is that we don't yet really understand the impact that COVID-19 will have on intergroup relations, whether that's across ethnicity, faith, um, generations, or socioeconomic divides, or indeed different local areas and regions. So I think, you know, we, we are quite rightly inspired by those, these incredible outbreak of kindness and social connections, and these many examples of communities organising to support neighbours. And people are being brought into new and different social connections with each other. However, we know that social mixing is one of the most powerful forms of reducing prejudice and promoting empathy between different identity groups. And as all those opportunities have now been very strictly curtailed, um, how that plays out in terms of really increasing the opportunities for bridging social capital, I think is, is something that is yet to be determined. And then I think at the same time, we're also being schooled to fear others as potential carriers of the virus. Um, and so there's this an incredible sense of uh, connection, but also an increased level of physical threat. And we know that social integration relies on a sense of equality between parties and reduced levels of threat. So social psychology tells us increased threat levels means we're more leniently inclined towards those we see as belonging to our in-group and less kindly disposed to those we see as being not belonging to our in-group. So I think, again, that's another thing that we want to examine as, we, as, this, as this crisis unfolds. Um, you quite rightly point out that the AME communities are disproportionately affected, both in terms of health um, outcomes, but also um, in terms of economically, because they're often in lower income groups and are more likely to have employment, which means that they have to travel or work outside the home, therefore putting themselves at greater risk. 
And I think one of our reflections is that it's becoming much more evident as lockdown carries on that different groups of people are having quite different experiences of lockdown. And, um, and that uh, it's, it's kind of shone a spotlight on that in some ways. And that we've had to recognise how utterly reliant as a society we are on those who care for the elderly, the vulnerable, nurse the sick, grow and pick our food, stock the shelves, drive the delivery trucks that fill the supermarkets and drive the buses and trains that take us to work, deliver the post. And I think we're really interested to see how our perceptions shift, both about those roles and professions which we've formerly seen as kind of low skilled and, um, and uh, less important. And how that shifts in terms of now those, those people are key workers and are absolutely essential to both our, the smooth running of both our economy and to society. Um, so I think where Belong sits is that we feel that we're actually only at the beginning of the story and there's, there's still a while to go. And as lockdown will be um, lifted probably at different times in different places and perhaps according to age, health, occupation, we don't really know yet how that's going to affect our perceptions going forward. So we think that it's got the potential to increase social connection, but also to increase division. So we've just launched a research project um, to really examine that and look at how at regional community levels and in, uh, intergroup relations and integration are improved or hindered by this crisis. And what are the lessons that we can learn for future policy in order to build sort of stronger, more resilient places? Um, I think the report has really hinted at the crucial role that place plays in levels of social connection. For example, I think the mapping of uh, mutual aid groups against a range of different areas um, and noticing there are less mutual aid groups in places that are higher on deprivation and disease. I mean, I think that's, that's, that's really important and unsurprising given the MPC report last year, which mapped charity sector by deprivation. And unsurprisingly, lower income neighbourhoods are less established charity and voluntary and community sector infrastructure. And well, I think we know that place plays an absolutely vital role in shaping um, and influencing local connections. And I think in this case, local responses to COVID-19. So we know that um, social connection, you know, from uh, international disasters and crisis, um, has a huge role to play in terms of building future resilience and that communities that recover best from disasters are the ones where people are connected to another, one another. Um, so I think we really feel we need to understand more about those place-based factors that influence social connection and bridging and bonding social capital. And I like your recommendation around MHCLG reviewing its uh, integrated communities plan as it goes forward. And we'd really like to see MH, uh, MHCIG really continue to adopt and develop that place-based approach. Uh, last week, as part of the launch of our research project, we heard from four of the five integration areas, uh, Walsall, Bradford, Blackburn, with Darwin and Waltham Forest, and all of them cited the previous work they'd done in establishing local integration partnerships, strengthening their connection with local faith, um, voluntary and community sector groups, as having meant that they already had those ready-made networks of engaged community and social activists in place to help mobilise aid efforts and were able to adapt and flex very quickly to the constraints of lockdown, moving services online, setting up befriending, ensuring vital health messages were translated into different languages. Um, so I think the role of uh, social connection and integration in terms of building resilience, I think, is really sort of coming to the fore. And I just struck by um, your findings, Will, on social connection being absolutely vital in terms of how communities were able to respond. Um, and then I was also struck by Robin's evidence in relation to the experience of Calderdale, who because of the mobilising of the community to respond to those devastating floods earlier this year, they were able to draw on that work they've done and those strong networks and relationships to mobilise their COVID-19 response. So I think social connection is, is going to become absolutely crucial as, as we go forward. Um, I think a couple of other things. One is just to pick up on what Will was saying about um, civil society structures and infrastructure and how crucial that is in terms of 
um, both responding but also developing resilience. Um, and uh, NCBO, Akivo, and NAVCA have all been talking about the um, the paradox of virtue that, that that we'll describe, which is that as demand increases for their services, um, resources are are decreasing. There, you know, often uh, those organisations that provide that absolutely vital social glue are very small. They've got very limited reserves. They're run by one or two people on a shoestring, but are actually doing absolutely essential work in local connect, local communities. So I think um, making sure that those organisations are supported as we go forward is going to be is going to be really important. Um, and then I think finally, just a thought about the role of arts, culture, and sport, because I think as um, as we emerge from um, the pandemic and um, as some gatherings are allowed again. Well, I think it's going to be quite a while before mass gatherings are allowed, but as smaller gatherings are allowed, I think the role of community arts, culture and support, sport is going to be really important in terms of aiding that kind of healing and recovery. But also, we th I think we need to understand more about the role of arts, culture and support, sport in helping us to reduce prejudice and promote pro-social attitudes and behaviours, because I think as opportunities for social mixing are more limited. We need to, we need to think about other ways of um, promoting empathy across difference and reducing prejudice and really um, sort of forging that stronger bridging social capital. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Um, the, 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 the evidence we've heard and that's reflected uh, in the report is very much about the importance of place and the different issues that are affected in different ways. So it's quite difficult a conversation to sort of come across the top when it's quite very reflected in some questions as well that people have been uh, sending in. Uh, Jane East has uh, said that the you know digital divides are clearly important, but there are bigger issues of income, wealth, uh, rural urban, and so on. So different divides in different places, something to challenge. Just to bring, but just to group together a few questions that we've that we've got. A few people are asking about the COVID groups um, uh, and the analysis of the COVID groups. And um, so let me ask people to come back on that. Richard Williams um, asks. Did these mutual aid groups already exist pre-COVID? Were they ready to go as part of the resilience infrastructure? How far was that the case? Simon Hewitt Avison says, can we assume that where there aren't registered groups, that there is weaker social fabric? Might not there be particular groups getting on with one another, maybe in smaller groups, maybe in extended families? Bit of a caveat there about drawing too much into this data. And um, Pip Tyler in particular, who works in Yorkshire and Humberside, would like to hear a bit more about Grimsby, which is Will Tanner and onwards. What, why, why, did you, uh, why did you look at Grimsby and what, what, what were your particular findings there? So maybe if I can, uh, maybe if I can come back um, and ask people about that. Jill, do you want to say something about the COVID groups pattern and what, what, what do we know about what's grown up, where and why? I mean, the, uh, the analysis is kind of has got caveats. It's a snapshot. The groups don't represent sort of the WhatsApp forums that have kind of sprung up among schoolgate mums or people that live on a particular street. Uh, in the report, we talk about their history, uh, their origins in a kind of group of people that came uh, together in London. Uh, uh, kind of people who've been involved in community organising set up the website and then kind of let the groups do their own thing. Uh, how they've emerged is, uh, how they've evolved is quite interesting uh, and I think it'll be interesting to keep track of them. Uh, some of them are sort of quite formally constituted, they kind of elect uh, they elect coordinators. They've got close. Uh, they've got close uh, relations with local charities, and they're referring people to each other. Uh, others are just kind of another Facebook page uh, where people ask where you can buy flour locally, that kind of thing. But uh, I think as kind of self-help, mutual aid, they are an interesting form of bridging social capital uh, and it 
is it will be interesting to see how they are evolve. I mean, potentially some of them could eventually become our formal charities. The last thing I wanted to say on mutual aid is that it is a constant pattern of British history. Our building societies, our some of our a lot of our insurance industry are emerged through a process of kind of 19th century mutual aid. So I think it's, some, it's, uh, it's something that is important socially and always has been. Um, Will, did you want to come back there with a specific question about Brinsby as well? Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Sunder. Um, uh, can I just, before I do, I might just um, just add to what Jill has just said. So in our research, we, we spoke to various uh, online platforms, including Facebook and Nextdoor and others who have been kind of the platforms for lots of the organisation of these mutual aid groups. And the scale is truly uh, um, staggering. So I think F Facebook um, told us that two million people had joined uh, mutual aid groups uh, in the period, in the kind of period up to the 9th of April, so um, really only in a month after the beginning of lockdown, 2,000 local support Facebook groups set up. Um, uh, and uh, I think um, about 800,000 of that had happened just in the seven days before lockdown. So kind of enormous outpouring of, of public spiritedness. Um, I guess the, the longer term question about those groups is, the extent to which they can become institutionalized forms of local support or whether or not they fall away in the same way as kind of organically in the way that they they were created and clearly there's a challenge for local and national policy makers as they approach that um, the reason why we chose grimsby uh was was actually very simple we we had uh, about a month before the crisis hit we'd launched a big program of work a two-year cross-party review uh, called Repairing Our Social Fabric, um, which uh, is chaired by Lord O'Shaughnessy and uh, has people like Danny Kruger and John Crudis on the advisory board. Um, and uh, as part of that piece of work, um, we had deliberately decided to go and visit uh, seven different communities around the United Kingdom, uh, Grimsby, Glasgow, Dagenham and Barking, uh, Barking and Dagenham, um, but also Bridgend, uh, Tiverton, uh, um, Inniskillen, um, and uh, a number of other places. Um, so um, I, Bolton is the final one. Um, uh, but and and the, the, and for those places, the idea behind that was basically we didn't want to start talking about the social fabric and community without actually going and consulting real people on the ground. So Grimsby was one of the areas where um, we'd. Uh, we'd already intended to do some work and indeed had already done some qualitative research so it was a natural fit um, and also Rob Walsh the chief executive of North East Lincolnshire um, Council is one of the advisory board members for that group so it was an area where we had existing links as well so he, he and his team were very helpful in facilitating our research. Thanks and um, um, Peter it'd be good to hear your thoughts just about this balance of you know, formal groups, less informal groups, helping out with neighbours and so on. What, what's your sense been of, of the mix and what, what appeals where and why? Well, if, I, if, I, if I talk for a moment or two about the situation in Darlington, um, and, and, and I, we, we've got a perfect example of that conflict between an existing organisation with its infrastructure and a, a mobilised volunteer force. And the mobilised volunteer force in Darlington, I have to say, were very quick to get set up. They, um, echoing what Will had said, they had something like 6,000 members join their Facebook page within a matter of days. So that was truly phenomenal. Um, what it did highlight, though, was that a volunteer group with no infrastructure from the ground up, from the bottom up, was, was very quick to get started but we did have some incidents of um, inappropriate behavior and activity that was very difficult to police initially and I'm talking there about um, CRB checks, um, veracity of volunteers etc. Um, if I contrast that with um, we have an organization called Darlington Cares uh, 
which is a, a, a volunteer force coordination of various charities in the town. And, and they stepped up to the plate as well and worked hand in hand with the local authority hub who were coordinating uh, support for the shielded and the people who were in isolation and, and lockdown. And, and the two approaches gave a, a very clear distinction between the two because one was one was very quick but had some problems and the bureaucracy of an organization that was coming out of a local authority was was quite evident and they wanted to do things properly and I'm not criticizing them for that but I, seeing that contrast um, and I, I think I think Will's point is is a sensible one these these groups and organizations that have um, risen out of social media calls to action bottom-up community involvement stirring um, volunteering it, it is admirable but these are people who will often either already be involved in a variety of other organizations other volunteers and be perfectly comfortable with the infrastructure around charities and volunteering groups etc and then there will be a number of people a large number of people who have seen that it's the right thing to do at this particular point in time and be very unfamiliar with the structures around charities and volunteering and the structure and, and I think that's part of the challenge of harnessing these people that unless we're we're grabbing them um, be that any organization out there who is trying to um, capitalize on these volunteers coming forward that these people are not familiar with being involved with organizations in that way so those people who are familiar with organizations and regular volunteers and participants I think they will stay if they're harnessed properly but I think it, we need to tread quite carefully in terms of making sure that those people who have come forward um, I know of a number of people myself within my, my own friend circle who have signed up for the uh, the NHS volunteering scheme and and have effectively given up because the the need hasn't been there to meet the supply of volunteers that came forward and I think that's why we're partly seeing people drop away from that participation because the NHS hasn't been as overwhelmed in the sense that um, the numbers that were particularly anticipated at the, at the start of this. So that, that's a huge challenge, I think, in terms of making some models work that keep those people involved and engaged, but doesn't become too onerous and too structured that it scares them away again. And Jared, it'd be good to hear your thoughts on that. I mean, we're hearing about the virtue of the self-organized, uh, the importance of the coordination and some of the tensions that have always been there between those two things. Are we learning more about getting that balance right or is it getting more challenging? Well, I think, I think I'm just sort of reflecting on, on what Peter said and I, I think I'd, I'd echo much of what Peter said. I think there, you know, I think they're, that they're a group of, that some people who have um, stepped up to kind of get involved in mutual aid groups probably have already had some experience of volunteering previously, probably maybe more formal experiences of volunteering. But I think there also is a, a, a big group of people who perhaps are volunteering for the first time. And um, uh, I, I've worked a lot with volunteers in, in my past working life. And, and there's a huge amount of um, communication and messaging that you need to do with new volunteers in terms of, you know, supporting them to understand processes and supporting them to understand why things like GDPR and data protection and safeguarding are actually important when you're dealing with vulnerable people. So I think that I think there have been some kind of conflicts and tension around those things um, in some of the mutual aid groups. Um, but I think it would be a shame if we lost that enthusiasm and energy that, that people um, have in terms of wanting to do something for their neighbors and their, and their local community. And I think thinking of how we can really capture that then I think is, 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 um, is important. Thanks. Now, just looking at the various questions we've got, we've got a lot of people sharing their specific experiences as well as this challenge of, you know, using volunteers um, 
uh, and so on. I just want to ask you all a, a, a broader question now as we as we cast forward. Got got a question here from uh, Neil Denton, and he's part of something called the After Disasters Network, um, uh, Institute of Hazard Risk and Resilience at Durham University. So he's a sort of um, expert in these kinds of issues. Um, he says this: I'm not surprised by the findings of the Stage One inquiry or of the questionnaire of this audience because it's common in the early weeks of disaster response that we see this kindness, this altruism, people say they see this new sense of community. But the caution is that, is that this can be fragile and people can become thin-skinned and they continue to try and live with unmet need and they realise that they've got different needs as well. So we might see more tension and conflict in the next phase than we saw in the last phase. So is that on the government agenda? Um, are we prepared for community conflict or, or um, you know, to um, add something to that? Are, are there ways to sort of Harness, harness the good and, and, and get round that. What, what are your, what are your broad thoughts about about that issue? About whether it will get tougher now than it has so far? Or might we lose that halo? Will is, do you want to give us some thoughts about? That? Yes, I'd be delighted to. Actually, um, in evidence to your inquiry, uh, Cindy, I don't know if you remember, but I, I did make reference to disaster sociology because um, there is quite a established literature on the. Uh, the various phases of response after different types of disaster and as you say as the, the question um, kind of related uh, the initial stage is usually one of, of altruism and an action um, shortly followed by uh, what can be called the inventory phase where people um, realize the limits of their own uh, abilities to help and uh, the limits of uh, of potential action um, and which can be followed by a period of, of loss and grief and, and where seri quite serious mental health problems can set in. Um, and I think that is a very real risk that we should be alive to. Certainly in the research that we've done, we've seen some evidence that uh, the groups that have been responding on the kind of front line in communities are suffering a degree of fatigue. Um, uh, to be perfectly honest, even in our organisation, we're suffering a bit of fatigue. So we're all stuck at home uh, in our bedrooms, um, not actually having to deal with the, the consequences on the front line. So I think, um, understandably, there is a risk that lots of that uh, that kind of positive energy is lost, um, and what's left is uh, it, Kind of has some quite serious consequences for, for people's well-being. Um, I think this is on the government's agenda for what it's worth and I think it's informed some of the approach to uh, releasing uh, people from some of the restrictions around lockdown. It's been notable the government has um, uh, tried quite hard to um, encourage people to do more physical exercise and to be outside more in some of the, in some of the initial um, reopening guidance. Um, and um, clearly worked quite hard, albeit I think there was more to do to give people an ability to expand their social network and to to build um, uh, to build out a kind of greater degree of of, of kind of relationships um, in order to potentially mitigate some of those adverse effects, um, uh, as well as helping people to get back to work where it is possible. Um, so I think this is quite high up on the government's uh, agenda, but. Um, but there is, I think, clearly all the research that I have seen would suggest there's quite a lot more that we need to do to mitigate some of the, the effects that um, the questioner talked about. Jill, do you want to give us your thoughts about that? I just wanted to offer a few reflections for, from some online focus groups that British Future has been doing as part of another project. And it's very, it's very striking how our people's views are have changed even over a kind of three week period are uh, kind of a couple of weeks ago people were very uh, united are uh, and are uh, really felt that kind of are uh, that uh, the crisis had largely brought people together but uh, this week are, it's very evident that kind of new tensions are emerging are around people's perceptions that some groups aren't are observing social distancing and 
are around difference, uh, differences in opinion about kind of threat and safety and about going uh, out to work. Uh, people will often point to groups kind of 15 down, miles down the road or in London uh, and make, and we found that people were making kind of negative undisparaging remarks about people that they perceived weren't are uh, weren't are uh, observing social distancing how those tensions will pan out i just uh, it's very difficult uh, to predict it's an ex it's an extremely uh, fluid situation but i think there are things that can be done to kind of mitigate against them and are uh, keeping the kind of majority of people outside or on sorry on side are uh, and voices that have reach are uh, across the spectrum are really important local voices are uh, and uh, national voices so keeping people on side now and stopping those divisions accentuating i think is something that community leaders faith leaders are uh, and the government needs to be thinking about. What's your sense, Joe, of whether there is a, a sense of that, you know, fragmenting after the peak of the crisis? Uh, well, I think there's a there's a couple of things really. I mean, one is uh, that that's partly why we are develop develop the research project that we have, which is about taking the temperature in communities at monthly intervals over the next six months and really looking at things like levels of trust. Um, perceived threat, whether attitudes and behaviours change towards particular groups. So I think sort of understanding what some of the factors that might be that are going to influence that is, is important. Um, and we're also doing a range of deep dives into particular communities, particularly communities which are usually have less access to voice and are more marginalised. And we're also looking at what's happening with those community activists in terms of what they're picking up in local areas. Um, we've been running a program um, called Shared Ground, which is a program which really helps uh, community practitioners, community activists, and those working in frontline roles in local communities to build their capacity and their skills and their confidence to deal with conflicts and tensions. And actually we had just, just as lockdown started we actually began our first pilot in Manchester and had to very quickly make it into an online course and certainly some of the um, people on the course were sharing tensions that they could see um, quite early on emerging in different communities so I think Neil is, is, is right I think you know it's something that we need to be alert to I think leadership um, such as Jill's described, has a huge role to play in making, in, in trying to ameliorate the effects of that. But I think also we need to sort of build the capacity and skills of local leaders and community activists to be able to sort of work with those tensions as they arise in a kind of creative and productive way that, that develops and builds shared ground. Thanks. Now, this has been the interim report of an inquiry, and so Peter and the other MPs will now be taking forward, um, you know, all of the themes that we've that we've heard of in the inquiry. So I just want to offer the um, the group uh, uh, another voting point now, which is we're obviously going to look at lots lots of themes, but just a sense of this virtual room. What what's your what's your what would you say was the, the highest priority? What's most top of mind for you of the um, the options that we're that we're offering you if you could just pick one you might think they're all uh, important and if if we left the thing off that's really important tell us in q a and tweet it as well but just as a just as a snapshot i'm not going to say this is a nationally representative poll of civil society or anything as a snapshot what what is most on the minds of the people we've got in the room today is one of these things uh, a higher priority for you than the others and we'll tell the parliamentarians sort of what the what the mix was of this particular um, discussion and so if you've had time to um, to consider your options there I think we're going to make that quite a quite a snapshot poll and close it very quickly so we can show you the results and go back to the panel and uh, 
get their thoughts at the end. So the um, the weaker areas, the weaker the areas that that have less social infrastructure, maybe the disparity between areas that that is that is leading uh, the group of you here um, with other people interested in coordination of the statutory and civil society of ethnic disparities of digital inclusion and the others, but a reasonably clear steer from you there about, about the, the, you know, the central theme that, that seems to be emerging as we think, as we think longer term. Um, let me go back um, to the group now. This will be the last, uh, the last minute or two. So just, just your, just any one reflection on just a, a big, a big theme, a big theme going forward. We haven't got time to pick it, pick, pick up everything uh, completely. Jill, I'll start with you. I think kind of going forward, and it's reflected in the vote, are strengthening social infrastructure, bridging social capital, linking social capital in our areas are, that are, have, have, have struggled. I will. So, um, so I think the, the main thing for me is um, thinking quite hard about institutionalising the goodwill and the um, civic mindedness that we've seen over the last uh, few weeks and months and turning it into uh, kind of structures and, uh, and kind of an institutional framework at local level that can sustain beyond the immediate crisis. I think lots of the groups that we've seen will need um, uh funding they'll need to some degree uh um recognition from government both local and national um and there is a really powerful opportunity to to kind of um uh create a foundation within many communities from the groups that have emerged and from the the energy that people have put in um but there's also a very real, real risk that if that is lost then people will be less inclined to volunteer to support to um, uh, to lack out for their neighbours in future, and um, so I think there is a there is a kind of double edged sword here. Either either we can um, uh, or a double -edged, double sided coin, I should say. Either we either we kind of buttress and um, and retain that that level of, of civic society, or there is a risk that it falls away and creates an even bigger gap than existed before. And so I think it's really imperative that we think carefully about how to institutionalise that support. Thanks. Joe, what would your priority be of all of the many priorities we all have? I think it would be an underlying one of really embedding um, considerations around social integration, um, building, bridging social capital into all those efforts, um, whether it's strengthening civil society or volunteering or um, uh, capturing the energy of the, the COVID mutual aid groups. I think it's about embedding that those kind of concepts around social integration and what it is and really understanding that because I think that will help strengthen us as we go forward. Thanks and Peter I'd like to give you the last word in terms of you and the other parliamentarians will be taking this forward what, what do you see as the as the big challenges we think beyond this immediate period now to some of the longer term issues we're facing for the period ahead? Well, it, it, it's clear from the discussion that we need to do more to bring our communities together. And this report has highlighted some, some issues around the background to that. The, the key for me, and there's, an, there's a, I'm not sure what the word is here, but um, there's, there's a, a disconnect between us saying that we want our communities to be more connected and all of these volunteers have come forward and we need to harness them. But I think if we go back to some of the things that we discussed earlier, when we, when we highlighted that sort of top down big government control is not necessarily the best thing and that groundwork, that groundswell of support coming forward. So I think it's a very fine line to, to tack between harnessing those communities, harnessing that goodwill, building that social connectedness, improving connection in our communities that isn't necessarily interfered with by government saying, you know, here's a pot of cash, here, get yourselves together, organise a volunteer force. If I look at examples in Darlington, those those organizations that best serve their communities and are most rooted in their communities are those that have the least level of reliance on government funding, local government funding, and that come from the ground up. 
and it's striking that balance. This has been a hugely informative session um, and I, I want to thank you Sunder for your chairing of it um, and thank all of the contributors to the APPG and I look forward to continuing the work on this important topic. Thank you, Peter. Thanks to the panel. Thanks to everyone with expertise as well, um, you know, locally, and you've shared some questions. We haven't heard very much of that in this format. We've got the hashtag today, COVID connection. I hope you'll share things on that. The, the slides are, are there as well. British Futures are Secretariat, so do, do engage with us about the next stage of this inquiry and clearly we'll be setting out more about that but we'd also be very glad to see to hear more in that public discussion in public forums um, about your experiences and your reactions to the report so thanks very much everybody for taking part in this short session today um, we appreciate it please stay in touch and uh, good good luck with staying connected for the rest of the, the rest of the day and the rest of the lockdown thanks very much.